Hey, what's up? It's H.J. and welcome to my second and third John Bible study. It's going to be three weeks in second John, three weeks in third John. We're going to do it all in one six week chunk. And we are going to learn so much about the Lord and his heart for his church and how we can have godly love that's rooted in truth and just how to respond as believers. I think it's going to be really encouraging. And so let's dive in today. We're going to just start this first week off with second john verses one through three stay tuned at the end to learn about this awesome giveaway that i'm doing you're gonna want to win this so second john is written by john let's talk a little bit about who john is there's not a lot of backstory on second john actually so i was looking up like the context the historical context which is like what's going on in history who are they writing to and all of these things there's not much information so he's writing to a church which we'll get to um we don't know who the church is we don't know where the church is we don't even really know specifically why and what's going on for him to want to talk to them in this letter but um, that's fine. So instead of looking at a, a deep historical context like we did in our Colossian study, we're just going to look at a little infographic. I thought it might be fun uh, to just say, who is the Apostle John? Who is the person that is writing this? Let's get to know him a little bit better. So we see that according to church tradition, John is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, he writes about that in his book, John. And it's funny because he's saying that about himself because he's the author, but he's like, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And you're like, oh, okay, so you guys are tight. That's cool. Um, we see that he was one of the closest disciples to Jesus. So Jesus had 12 disciples. One of them didn't love him. We're not going to talk about Judas right now. Um, and then he had three that was like his inner, inner circle. Those are the men that he was really pouring into because he wanted them to go forward after he was gone and really lay the foundation and start to deeply spread Christianity around the globe. And those people were Peter, James, and John. Um, John was actually the person, when you think back to Jesus being on the cross, um, he was going to die. And then his mother was standing there and he looked at John and he said, this is your mother. And essentially what he was saying is, I'm going to be gone. And in this society in our culture today she needs a man to make money to protect her um to like give her any sort of status in society at all and she so he pretty much looked at john and said this is now your mother take care of her after i'm dead love her provide for her protect her that's how close john was with jesus so he was really close with him um john is considered a pillar in the church along with Peter and another, James, Jesus' brother. Um, again, those were the three close to Jesus out of the disciples. And he was really just one of those foundational people on which the church was built after Jesus was gone. He started off as a fisherman, chill dude, just out here, you know, in the water. Not one of the highest men in society, not one of the smartest men in society. And Jesus still chose to use John in such mighty ways to build his church. So with that in mind, let's jump in to 2 John 1 through 3. Um, the elder to the elect lady and her children. Pause. So every time you get into scripture, you want to ask yourself two questions, especially when you're starting a new book. Really, any time you're reading scripture, you want to say, who is speaking or who's writing and who are they writing to? Um, it helps you to get context because if he was writing to unbelievers, then I'm going to respond differently in my practical application than I would if he was writing to believers or if he was writing to the Jews or writing to the Greeks or it matters who they're writing to. So we see the elder. This is John calling himself an elder. Um, why is he not calling himself an apostle? Right here, elder is just synonymous for pastor. So elder, shepherd, pastor, um, these are all words that mean the same thing. They mean pastor. And I think there's a few other too, like bishop, I think is one of them. But he's pretty much saying, I'm Pastor John, and I'm writing to the elect lady and her children. And I'm not going to lie, the first time I read this, I was like, so is this letter to a woman and her child? That's so different than all of the other letters we see in the New Testament, but it's actually not. So if you look into it deeper, the elect lady actually means a church, 
which makes sense because he's calling himself a pastor. He's introducing himself and, and speaking from, not from the perspective of disciple, like we're used to, but from the perspective of pastor, church planner, this person. And some of the reasons in my notes right here why the elect lady is known to be as a church is because um, most of John is written in second person plural, which makes sense for a congregation listening to it. Um, it's not just written to one specific person in the language of the letter. Um, and then her also, <laughs> sorry, I'm like trying to get my, hold up, my words together. And then also using the word lady makes sense because in the Greek, the word church is actually feminine. And you see that in other parts of scripture where like Jesus calls the church his bride and it wouldn't be weird or out of the blue or out of left field to, ref to refer to the church as a lady. So it's not random. It's actually pretty easy to see after a little research or whatever that this means church. And then her children isn't speaking about a person or actual children. It's speaking about a congregation, which again goes with the second person plural language in the letter and goes with the pastor and church theme. So this is Pastor John speaking to a church, church's congregation. We actually don't know what church this is. We don't know exactly where it is, um, very specifically, Asia Minor probably. So there's not a lot that we know about this church, but it's all right. There's still a lot that we can learn about what God wants for the church, which does apply to us. So let's keep going. So he's saying whom, so these people whom I love in truth, those two words right there are going to be big ones for this section. So every time I see the word love and truth, I'm just going to highlight it for you. Love, truth, not only I, but also oh, who know the truth because of the truth that abides in us and will be thus forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be in us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father in truth and love. So whenever you're reading scripture, pro tip, look for repetitive words. Repetitive words will help you to see probably what the themes are going in. If I keep mentioning the word plants, water, leaves, green, like you're probably going to say, oh, she's talking about plants or she's talking about gardening. They help you to understand what I'm talking about. So these repetitive words, love and truth, um, is literally what this book is about. It's about godly love rooted in truth. And so he's saying, I love you, church, but what type of love is he talking about? He is saying, I love you in truth. So this isn't just any kind of flippant love. This isn't any kind of worldly love. This is a love that has parameters. This is a love that means something. So what is love and truth? Well, what is the truth? And we know that the truth, this is obviously talking about truth that is gospel-centered. Christ-centered, godliness. Um, so he's saying, I don't just love you, but I love you with a very specific love that is rooted in the gospel, that is rooted in Christ-centeredness, that is rooted in godliness. He's actually adding depth to the type of love. He's not just like, oh, yeah, no, I love you, so let me send you some snacks. I mean, if you sent me some snacks, I'd be like, hey, you probably do love me. I love when friends show up a little with little surprises for me, right? That's love. But if somebody's like, hey, I'm going to sit next to you while you're weeping over your sin and pray with you and help you work through struggles. Now that's love and truth. That's love rooted in gospel and rooted in godliness. That's a deeper love than just somebody who brings me snacks, right? So he's identifying the type of love and the type of way that he loves his church. Ask yourself some questions. Always want to be asking yourself questions about what you're reading. So I wrote down, what is truth? We answered that. How do you know if you have it? What is the proof for that? Which we're actually going to get to the answer of. Another question I ask, what is truth in love? What does that look like? What does it look like in your personal life today with the people you know, with the places you go, with your schedule and your timing and your ministry? What does it look like for you to love people with a gospel-centered love? I think that's something you should answer for yourself after this study that will help you get more depth out of it. Can a believer love the church without it being rooted in truth? That's a great question. Um, 
everything that we do for the church should stem from wanting to bring God glory, wanting to bring the gospel to more ears, wanting to see people grow in Christ. If we're loving people, but it's not rooted in that, it might just be like a fake love where we're serving people, but it's really only because it elevates our status or it makes us look good or it makes us feel accomplished. And in those moments, you may think you're loving the church, but it's not a love that's rooted in truth. So that might be another question for yourself. The ways that I am loving the truth, the church, is it truly rooted in truth or is it rooted in selfishness and pride and fame or whatever it may be? These are great questions to ask that bring in practical application for the scripture. So moving on, he says, let me switch my little color. He says, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. So it's not just like only pastors and apostles have to be the ones to love the church this way. All who know the truth should be loving the church. If you claim to know the truth, this is a spiritual knowledge, okay? This is not some like, just anybody can have this knowledge. Unbelievers don't have this knowledge. They may know how to do great things in this world, be doctors, all of that type of stuff. But spiritual knowledge of the truth and gospel and Christ and godliness and holiness, that only comes from somebody who has a heart for God, who's been saved, who's been changed, who's been given their new nature, okay? And if you claim to have that, then you also must love the church in truth. So ask yourself, how am I loving the church? How should I love the church? Where should I repent from not loving my church? Um, and that may be just personal thoughts in your head. That may be actions you're not doing, ways you're not serving, things like that. But why do we do this? I love this word because. Because is actually a really important word whenever you are reading scripture. Um, because we can make things mean things that they don't actually mean. We don't want to give our own reasoning and our own um, ideas to scripture. We want scripture. We want God to tell us what he's trying to tell us. And we'll wrestle with that. And God is saying through John, right? Because all scriptures breathed out by God, breathed out and inspired by him. That the reason this is important because the truth that abides in us. There's that us language again. All us. That's me and you. That's this whole church will be with us forever. So abide. Let's talk about that abides. I reference back to John 14 where it talks about abiding in Christ. What does that mean to abide in him? Um, I could go into a whole nother Bible study on that and I'm not, I'm not going to try to do that today. But the truth abides in us. It is a part of who we are. It's something we are constantly seeking and giving up other things to be able to seek and to be able to hold close and tight. And we push away everything that would take that truth from us. That is abiding in its daily living and loving and breathing and praying and seeking and crying for that truth to be in it. And I love this, check this out. It will be with us forever. One of the reasons why we as believers of the church need to be loving the church in truth is because it will be with us forever. These are the people that we will be loving forever, that we will be with for all of eternity, the new heavens and the new earth. And this love is something that is going to continue with us for all of eternity. So start now, put it on now, love today. Because if you don't know how to love your church today, it's something you're gonna be doing forever. So don't wait, start learning how to do that now. But here's the thing, that with us forever is actually like a really assuring promise. Remember, the gospel is promised, our salvation and our eternal life is promised forever, and the love that comes with that comes forever. And that's proof, that's proof it's real love, that with us forever is really assuring and comforting. So then he gets in and he says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. So now he's talking about three different attributes that he's actually are saying come from that love. So if you have this love, you're going to have grace, you're going to have mercy, and you're going to have peace. He's actually saying here that God gives us grace, mercy, and peace. So really he's saying we're going to imitate the Father 
and Jesus, the Father's Son. I love that. And we are going to have what they've already given us. So this, this um, one thing I was reading in my studies is that this grace, mercy, and peace is actually in that order on purpose. So grace comes first. It's only by the grace of God that we even want him, that we even see him as beautiful, that we even want to repent of sin, that we even want to have faith. So first, you have to have grace from the Lord, opening your eyes, opening your heart. And then from that grace flows mercy and peace. Then what happens? We get that mercy from Jesus where he pays for our sin. He pays for our debt. He makes us able to come into the throne room of the Father and pray and be with Him. And He wipes away and He pays for that sin. Um, He gives us salvation. And then from that flows peace. This is is peace with God. Because remember, Scripture says that when we were not saved, we were at enmity with God. We were... um, enemies of God. We were against God. The wrath of God abided on us, but now we have peace from God the Father in Jesus Christ, where we get to be in his family. We get to be in his church, and this produces love, root, and truth. These are qualities that go hand in hand. You can't have the truth without having love. You can't have love without having the truth. There are times, I believe, whenever Christians, we want to love other people well and we're trying to love other people well so maybe we allow things to slide allowing things to be okay that aren't okay in the church allowing people sin and when people ask you questions well what does the bible say about this and this and you know what the answer is but you know it's offensive well i'm just gonna love them um you know as long as you love jesus and you don't speak up for the truth and you don't push people towards the truth is that really love Is it love to allow people to think wrong things about God? Is it love to allow people to see only a partial view of who God is because you don't want to offend them? No, love and truth go hand in hand. But then here's the opposite side. You cannot have truth. Well, God says this and hellfire this and repent today or burn this or blah, 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 and not come in with gentleness and not remind them that Jesus wants to have a relationship with them and their sins can be forgiven and they can be made whole and there doesn't have to be condemnation and, um, and just a spirit of love. So they need to go hand in hand. You don't want to be too far on the only love, no truth. You don't want to be too far on the only truth, no love. But this grace, mercy, and peace that has been given to you should produce this truth and love. Um, Again, there's so much more I could pull out of this text. Um, I'm thinking of like three things right now, but I don't want this to take forever. I want you to just think on those questions I gave you and just make sure that you are imitating this grace, mercy, and peace the way that God you know, gave it to you. Imitate it for others. Where in your life do you need to give people grace? Where in your life do you need to give people mercy? Where in your life do you need to make peace with others? Um, I love you guys. That is what godly love looks like. It looks like truth. It looks like rooted in gospel. It looks like grace, mercy, and peace. It looks like abiding in Jesus. So just look at Jesus. Whatever he did, That's what you want to do. All right. I love you guys. I would love to hear your thoughts below, comments, questions. Um, Two things. I'm doing a giveaway. To head over to the Confident Girl Instagram and enter the giveaway. This is all of the New Testament and it is journaling. It's like that book of the Bible. It's like the book of Acts. But then it's the ESV, but with journaling space. So you can actually get deeper study, write notes. It's amazing. I have like seven different ones of these. I love using them. Um, You can win this and you can win free Starbucks. So head over to Instagram. I love you guys. Make sure to share this with a friend who can be encouraged by it. And I will see you next week for week two.